As you're being seated, go ahead and get your Bibles out and turn with me to Psalm 69. Psalm 69, we're going to be looking together this morning at verses 30 through 33 in Psalm 69. If you don't have a Bible, then go ahead and grab that one in the back of the pew in front of you, and you can find Psalm 69, verse 30, starting on page 453 of that Bible. Psalm 69, going to be looking at verses 30 through 33. This is the time of year, this is the weekend where we think a lot about thankfulness. This past weekend, you probably all gathered together with family and with friends, and you shared in a Thanksgiving meal. You've got commercials that are about Thanksgiving on the TV, you've got social media filled with people talking about thankfulness. And if you think about it, it it really is a beautiful thing because in a nation as divided as ours and in times as divided as, as ours, everybody pretty much universally thinks it's good to stop and to give thanks. Thanksgiving is something that we can agree on. This is good for us, that we should be thankful people. But here's a question that we can consider What does being thankful actually accomplish? Why is it that we should be thankful? I mean, beyond the fact that it's commanded to be thankful, to rejoice always, what effect does being thankful make in the world around us? We all have a sense that we should be thankful. We have a sense that... It's better to be thankful than to be a complainer. But what's the actual impact? How how does the world around us change when we choose to be thankful? Now, I think this is an important question that we need to be able to answer because oftentimes knowing that we should be thankful is not enough to actually make us thankful. Like we all know we should be thankful, but many of us oftentimes are not all that thankful. We choose rather to complain. Some of us were drawn to the negative, almost like a magnet. Just this past week, where just about everybody has Thanksgiving on the mind, a friend of mine was off from work, and he texted me and asked me if I wanted to go have lunch with him. I hadn't seen him in a while. It was good to catch up, and I had lunch with him, and I stopped by the house before I came back to the office, and while I was at home, Beth asked me, well, how did your lunch go? Now, I've got lots of options to choose from and how to answer that question. I could say something like, oh, man, it's so good to see my buddy. Hadn't seen him in a while. It's been a couple months since we've been able to share a meal together, and it was just, man, it was really good to just get to sit down with him and share a meal. I could have told her about some of the things we talked about. I could have said, hey, at the end of the lunch, after we had caught up on each other's lives, you started talking about what's going on in our churches. And as we were talking about that, I started to get really excited about the year coming up and where we could go and, and, and what we could do. And I just left really encouraged. I could have said that. What did I choose to say when she asked me how the lunch went? Oh, my meal was terrible. They brought out my food in a, and they, <laughs> they didn't drain the, the green bean juice before they put it onto the plate. And I like, I'm one of those people that want my food to touch on the plate. Like Thanksgiving is a nightmare for people like us, except when the people bring out divided plates. Anyways, they didn't drain the juice first. And so I had green bean juice in my mashed potatoes and my meat on my bread. I just... So then I told her the meal was terrible, and then I proceeded to tell her my last three meals at this place has been terrible. That's how I chose to answer the question. Like, first of all, Dustin, what's wrong with you? (laughs) But second of all, why is that so often the case? Why do, do some of us tend to be drawn more toward complaining than being thankful? Why is pointing out the negative so often much easier than pointing out the positive? We all know that we're not supposed to complain, that God commands us to be thankful, and yet we still find ourselves choosing to complain over gratitude. 
we need more than just a command. We need to see the beauty and the glory and the power and the result of what happens in the world around us when we choose to be thankful rather than complain. We need to see the results of what God says will happen when we choose to be thankful. And these verses help us see just that. They help us see the glorious results that happen when we choose to be thankful over choosing to complain. So let's hear these words together. Psalm 69, verses 30 through 33. I will praise the name of God with a song. I will magnify him with thanksgiving. This, this will please the Lord more than an ox or a bull with horns and hooves. When the humble see it, they will be glad. You who seek God, let your hearts revive. For the Lord hears the needy and does not despise his own people who are prisoners. Father, we, we pray and we ask you in this time. We've been praying all morning that you would help us to see the beauty of the Lord Jesus and to be changed by what we see. Father, help us to see the glory in choosing gratitude, even when there's many things in life we could choose to focus on and complain about. Help us to see the glory and the results of what happens when we choose thankfulness over complaining. Help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, we want to look at what happens, what are the results when we choose thankfulness. But before we do that, I want to make sure we have a clear understanding of what David means when he uses the word thanksgiving here. Because I think what David means by thanksgiving and the results that he then goes on to say is different than what we usually think about. When we usually think about thanksgiving or being grateful, we usually think about, okay, I'm, I'm going to take a catalog of all the blessings that I have in my life, and then I'm going to strive to have a sense of gratitude about those things. I'm going, to, I'm going to make a list. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. We might say things like, well, I'm in good health. I'm thankful for my family. I'm thankful for my job. I'm thankful for my home. I'm thankful for the combination of chocolate and peanut butter. I'm thankful for the way that I feel when I see my children genuinely smile. I'm thankful for the privilege of being able to look into the eyes of my wife. I'm thankful for grandkids. Thankful for the way I feel when I'm in my living room surrounded by people who love me. I'm thankful for the beauty of, of a winter sunset. I think that's what we usually think about when we think about what well, we need to be thankful. We think about, okay, I'm going to make a list of, of reasons to be grateful. Some of you might even have had traditions about that when you eat Thanksgiving meals together. You go around the table and every person says something that they're thankful for. And I think that's good. We, we should do things like that. We should be thankful. We should count up the reasons why we should be thankful. I think that's a good thing. We should do it more than just once a year. That's good. But it's not what David means here when he talks about thanksgiving in verse 30. David's definition of thanksgiving is focusing on the goodness of God. Who he is, his character, what he's done, what he will do for us in the future. It's specifically a God-centered thankfulness. And we know that because the line, I will magnify him with thanksgiving in verse 30, is parallel in this poem with the first line of verse 30, which reads, I will praise the name of God with a song. 
So the way Hebrew poetry works is oftentimes you've got two lines and both of them are, they're, they're saying the same thing just in a different way. So line one, I will praise the name of God with a song. I will magnify him with thanksgiving. It's saying the same thing. And when you praise the name of somebody, you're praising their character, what they're like, what characterizes them. We also know that David's think. Thanksgiving is about God and who he is because the last line of this stanza of the poem, your Bible might separate with spaces what the different stanzas are, and 30 through 33 is a stanza. The last line in the stanza is about God's character, what he's like. The Lord hears the needy and does not despise his own people who are prisoners. So the thanksgiving that David has in mind is specifically a thankfulness that is centered on God. And even more specifically, the care that God takes for his own people when they are in trouble. The thankfulness he's talking about here is calling to mind the faithfulness of God, how that faithfulness has played out in the past, how that faithfulness will play out in the future because of his promises. It's choosing to call those things to mind. When we step back and look at the rest of the psalm and the rest of the poem that David writes here, it's clear that he is making this decision to center on the faithfulness of God in the midst of a life where not a lot of things are going right. David's life right now has a ton of hard things going on in it, and he's saying here in verses 30 through 33, Even though those things are going on, I'm going to choose to center my affections on God. I'm going to choose to think more about who he is and what he's like and what he's promised me that he's going to do and let that control how my heart feels, be thankful for it, and not these other things going on in my life. So the first 29 verses of this psalm are almost entirely about difficult things that describe David's life. Look back at them with me for a second. Verses one through three, David is saying, I feel like I'm gonna drown. His life is overwhelming him. He says, I have no place to stand. And this has been going on for a long time because he says, I've waited so long for God to deliver me. My eyes are growing dim. I've I've looked for him, waited for him. The help has not come that my eyes are starting to fail. In verse four, David says that there are people who hate him without cause. They're attacking him. In verse 5, he confesses that he has sin in his life before God. He can't hide from it. In verse 8, he says that the attack in verse 4 is personal. It's his own flesh and blood, his family. They've turned their backs to him. And then if we go through the rest of the 29 verses, David's going to use words like dishonor, reproach, weeping, humiliation, Sinking, deeps, pits, distress, shame, dishonor, despair, poison, thirst, affliction, pain. These are the words he's using to describe his life. His life is hard. But here's what David chooses to do. He says, even though all of that's going on, I will worship. Even though all these things are happening, He says, I will magnify the Lord. I will focus on his goodness. Thanksgiving for David is choosing to fix your mind on God, the good things he has done and the good things he's promised he will do and let those things control your heart even when you are sinking in distress and affliction and pain. Guys, I know all of us, we have things going on in our lives that are hard. They're not happy. They're frustrating. I was talking this morning. Oftentimes when really difficult things happen, it's easy for me to focus on the right things. But it's in the mundane, the irritating commercial, the traffic jam, things like that. That's where I lose my mind and go to complaining more often. When somebody asks us, how are things going? What's going on with you? We all have a choice that 
we can make about what we're going to choose to highlight. How are we going to answer that question? For many of us, there's a pull to go toward the negative. And if we think about it, that tendency is really rooted in what the Bible tells us. It's rooted in theology. Ever since Adam and Eve in the garden, our sinful nature has a tendency to focus on what's going on around us and not on what God has said and who God is. That's why it's so hard for us to fight against the pull to complain because our flesh is wired to turn away from God and turn toward what's going on around us. We're hardwired that way in our sinful nature. But we have to remember when we're in the fight to choose focusing on God over focusing on the negative things in our life, we have to remember God has given us the spirit to enable us, to work in us, to choose gratitude, to choose to fix our eyes on God. We can choose to focus on God. It's not a losing battle. Anybody ever tried to not complain for like a day or for a week? It feels like a losing battle. But I'm here to tell you it's not. We have the spirit of God within us. We can choose to do what David is doing here. Life full of mess going on, I'm going to worship. We can choose to do that. The rest of the psalm, he tells us what happens when we do that. What are the results? What happens when we choose to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit in our life and look at God and not focus on all the things going on around us in self-pity? I want to tell you two things that happens. Number one, when you choose to do that, when you choose to highlight the goodness of God, God is magnified in your life. God is shown to be as glorious as he is when you choose to point to his goodness when your life is hard. David says in verse 30, I will magnify him with, through, by thanksgiving. When we choose to focus on God, our mouths become the paintbrushes and our lives the canvas on which the goodness and greatness of God is made known to everybody else around us. We can be the vehicles through which God displays his greatness and his glory when we choose to be thankful. And y'all, isn't that what our lives, isn't that what they're supposed to be about? You see, we forget that. We think that life is supposed to be about us, and we forget that as Christians, our life is about shining the spotlight of glory on somebody else. Our lives are for the glory of God. That's, that's the, the heartbeat that should be within us. I want my life to glorify God, and he's telling us here that when we choose thankfulness, we can do that. Paul said in Philippians chapter 1, he says, he shows us the heart of what every believer should have. He says, it's my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. He says in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, so then whether you eat or you drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Psalm 40 says, may those who love your salvation say continually, great is the Lord. It should be the desire of our lives. The spirit beats within us with a pulse that says, may God be glorified. And when I choose to be thankful, when I choose to put the focus on him and who he is, even when life is hard, I get to do that. God is magnified in me. And when God has my heart, when I'm genuinely thankful in who he is, that's what he wants from me most of all anyways. Look at verse 31. He says, this, what is the this? This is choosing to praise the name of God with the song when life is hard. This, this will please the Lord more than an ox or a bull with horns and hooves. The ox having horns means it's older and so a more valuable sacrifice. The fact that it has hooves means that it's acceptable according to the laws laid down in Leviticus. So I could give an acceptable, costly sacrifice with my hands and that won't be as pleasing to the Lord as if as he is pleased when my heart 
chooses to be glad in him when my life is difficult. That's what he wants. He wants my heart. He wants me to be glad in him. But what so often happens to us is we forget that our lives are to be about bringing glory to God and we fall into thinking that life is about my happiness, my comfort, my ease, my way, my will. And so when things happen that don't make me happy or don't make me comfortable or when things happen that aren't easy or they're not going my way or they're not what I want to happen, what do we do? I complain. Complaining and self-pity and whining is what we do when we put ourselves at the center of the universe instead of God. John Piper says, all the root of all ingratitude is the love of one's own greatness. Complaining is what happens when we think life is about us and things going well for us and we forget that our life is about the glory of God. So when somebody asks you, how's it going? What are you gonna choose to highlight? Are you going to choose to highlight everything in the world that doesn't go the way that you want it to? Or are you going to choose to trust God? The words that you speak are like spotlights. The way that you answer, the way that you, the things that you highlight, you're throwing spotlights on things. So what are you going to spotlight with your words? In your car, in your home, in your workplace? in this building, out in the community, what are you going to choose to spotlight? If you spotlight thankfulness on the character of God, you magnify him and show his glory. But here's the second thing. Here's the second thing that happens. Not only is God magnified, but you have the opportunity to revive the hearts of people around you. Other people can listen to you, point to the glory of God, and they're going to be lifted up. Look at verse 32. He says, when the humble see it, see what? Well, it's the same thing as this in verse 31. When the humble see you going through a life full of affliction, lots of hard things happening, when they hear you, when they see you choosing to highlight the faithfulness of God, he says, when they see it, they will be glad. Then he says in the second line, you who seek God. Now he addresses those who are seeing this. Let your hearts revive. When you magnify the name of God, when you are going through something hard, you become a way that God can explode encouragement to the rest of his people. Others are reminded of God's faithfulness in the past. They're reminded of God's promises for the future. They're reminded that the Lord hears the needy and does not forget his people when they're locked down in affliction. And they remember that because of you. Y'all, we have to realize that the way that we talk always, always influences the people around us. And the people that hear us talk the most, we influence them the most. When we choose to focus on the negative and things that are not going well and things that irritate us, we are dragging the people around us down. But when we choose in all circumstances to highlight, here's who I know God is. Here's what he's promised me that he will do even in circumstances like this. And I'm gonna choose to believe that and by faith be thankful for it. When we choose to do that, other people around us who hear that are gonna be lifted up. So imagine this scenario. Imagine you're you're meeting a friend for breakfast. Now this particular friend, she's having a tough time. Her marriage is stressful, she's not connecting lately. She's got a big doctor's appointment coming up. She's worried about it, she's nervous. And she's hoping that, I just want to spend some time with with a Christian sister. I want to be encouraged. You come to the table, the waiter gets your drink orders, you order from the menu, 
And then as you're waiting for the food to come, the conversation really starts. Now, she doesn't want to just dive right into her problems. And so she asks you first, so, how are things going with you? Now, again, anytime somebody asks us that question, how are things going, sirens should be going off in our minds. Here's an opportunity. Here's an opportunity for me to throw the spotlight on something. What's it going to be? Now, imagine this. She asks that question, and you answer with a big, and then you begin to complain. About what? I don't know. About the car, about your husband, about your health, the weather. You choose to spotlight all the things happening in your life that are negative. How do you think that conversation is going to impact her? Now imagine this. Imagine she asks you, so, how are things going? And after she asked that, a smile, maybe slight, maybe pained, but a smile comes across your face. And you say, let me tell you just how good God has been to me. And you still tell her about the same things, the car, the husband, the health, all those things. But instead of those things being the focus, God is the focus. So you talk about the car and how much the cost to fix it is going to hurt and how surprising it was, but then you recount. But I remember a time earlier in my life when God provided for me. I didn't know where I was going to, it was going to come from, and he provided for me, and so I have confidence that he's going to do so again. You tell her about the tough times in your marriage, but then you tell her how those struggles have opened up your eyes to some things in you that you need to work on. And it's helped you see that marriage is a good thing. It's worth fighting for. You share your worries about your health, but then you tell a story about how God healed a friend of yours or how God worked in not healing to bring more people closer to himself. And then after telling her all those things, you say, isn't God always good to us? Doesn't he always come through when we're needy and tired? Now how do you think that friend is going to feel? Now how do you think she's going to think about the difficult situations that she's facing in her life? Y'all, we have such an opportunity when somebody asks us, how are things going? We have such an opportunity not only to magnify the greatness of God, but also to be the means by which God explodes encouragement to other people around us who are struggling, and we might not even know about it. We have the opportunity to shape how people see the world, not just for today, but maybe for the rest of their lives. One breakfast, one lunch, one conversation where you take the road less traveled and focus on the goodness of God, even in hard times, might change somebody else's life for years. I'll leave you with this. A good friend of mine was once telling me about a very difficult time he was having in his life. He had a name for the condition. I can't remember it. It's got like 18 syllables. It's really technical, but what happened was he had developed a condition in his ear where his canals were blocked. And it made it not only difficult to hear, but difficult to, to speak. Because whenever he spoke, his own voice would echo really loudly in his head and really loudly and in a very distorted way. You know when you get water in your ears or your ears pop on an airplane and it's, just, it's really loud? That's what it was like for him all the time. And the louder he spoke, the worse it was distorted and the worse it vibrated in his head. Now that would be difficult enough, but this friend of mine was a pastor, which means that he basically talks for a living. So every time he talked, it would almost drive him crazy because he, he couldn't get the feeling away and his voice just rattled around distorted and loud. He couldn't tell what the actual volume of his voice was, so he couldn't change it. He always sounded weird and distorted, and so every time he had to lead a meeting, every time he had to preach a sermon, he would just be so discouraged. He went to the doctors, and they could title 
the condition that he had, but they couldn't offer him anything for it. And so for months and months, this dragged on, just not being fixed. It's week after week of being discouraged and frustrated. But then as he was talking about this and he was relaying it to me, he said, you know what? I found that during this time where I was so frustrated, it was so hard, that my prayer life had never been deeper. And I memorized more verses about trusting in the power of God than he ever had before in his life. It was through being taken through a situation like that that he became aware that God was actually bringing him closer to himself was helping to him to experience more of his power, how it changed him in profound ways for the better, and that through the pain, through the difficulty, God had been faithful to him. Now, he told me that story over 10 years ago. And even now, that story will often come to mind when I am discouraged when I'm feeling down, when I see myself sinking and I feel in my heart, I'm getting, getting low, I can still hear my friend's voice say to me through the story, Dustin, this difficulty, this sadness, this frustration is a great opportunity because God is going to be faithful to you in the midst of that difficulty. You just wait and see. Him telling me that story one time over 10 years ago, even now, when I'm poor and needy and feel forgotten, it will revive my heart. And all of us have that same opportunity to be that person to somebody else. But the only way that we can do that is when we choose by faith to trust in the promises of God, to remember the faithfulness of God and call those things to mind even when life is hard. When we do that, we magnify the greatness of God and we revive the hearts of his people. So what are you gonna choose to do? Where are you gonna choose to focus the spotlight of your life? What things are you going to highlight? Brothers, sisters, choose to focus on God. Choose to focus on how you've seen him come through for you time and time again. Memorize the promises that he's made to you. Call those things to mind. Focus on it. Throw the spotlight on those. Don't drag other people down by choosing to complain and whine and have self-pity. Choose to focus on the faithfulness of God and magnify his greatness and revive the hearts of other people. The next time somebody asks you, so, how are things going? What are you going to say? Let's pray. Father, we ask you to help us. Help us to have the spirit-empowered faith to focus on your goodness to us in Jesus Christ. the faithfulness that you have accomplished for us over the course of hundreds of years, the promises that you have made for us of what will happen to us in the future. It's hard to focus on those things. Our flesh pulls us toward the here and now. And if the here and now is not good, it pulls us toward complaining. So help us, God. I've been trying to do this for a week and it's hard and I can see myself a month from now getting tired. Many of my brothers and sisters here have probably tried to have a gratitude challenge. It's hard, but not impossible because we have the spirit. So God, help us to focus on a thankfulness to you even when life is hard. Help us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.